Hi everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Ah, it's still wonderful and delightful to see everyone here today. So thank you so much for coming along. Uh, before we begin tonight's proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land that we meet on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the Chow Chak Wing Museum and the University of Sydney is built. And in, as we share our own knowledge and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever in the Aboriginal custodianship of the country that we gather in today. And it's really important that we do acknowledge um, our Indigenous elders, our Indigenous collections. And you can see all around us, um, including in the window here, different ambassadors from around this country that the Chow Chak Wing Museum cares for the collections here. Um, so it's really, really wonderful for me to be able to welcome everyone tonight. Paul Donnelly, our director, was supposed to be doing the honours today um, and being able to welcome our fabulous new uh, senior curator for the Nicholson Collection. Unfortunately, uh, he is in quarantine uh, due to, of course, COVID and has struck down his uh, family. Um, so we wish them all the best and we hope that they get better soon and Paul will be back on deck next week. So, But I am really pleased that, it's, um, that I'm able to kind of step in and fill in for Paul today. Um, first of all, it's because we've got a lot of programs coming up. Um, even though we've been so delayed with COVID and then the floods and then everything that's been going on, we do have a program of events really kicking off. So starting with tonight and then into April, uh, we have two um, events coming up. One's called Shared Voices, Performance, Knowledge and Connection. This is a symposium led by the Pacific Views exhibition co-curator Stephen Gagal um, on the diverse ways that Pacific people uh, record, preserve and celebrate their knowledge and histories. And that's on Saturday the 2nd of April at 1pm. And then following that, on the Thursday night, on, 7 uh, on the 7th of April, we have the fabulous Dr. Stavros Paspalos, who is the director of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, delivering his lecture, The Antiquities of Greece and World War II. So two events not to miss. You can book for those on our website and our calendar and all that kind of stuff. And I really hope to see you all uh, throughout the year as we continue to have programs again. It's wonderful. <laughs> Um, anyway, but tonight it's really my pleasure to be able to introduce our new senior curator for the Nicholson Collection, Dr Melanie Pitkin. Uh, Melanie is an Egyptologist and museum curator and joins us direct uh, from her post as the research associate at the Fitzwilliam Muse Museum, where she's been playing a key role in the museum's cutting edge interdisciplinary research into its Egyptian coffins. Uh, in particular, she's also been responsible for the making uh, this research more accessible and engaging to diverse audiences, both in the UK and in Egypt itself. Uh, Melanie has come with us with over 15 years of experience in museums. Uh, before she was at the Fitzwilliam, some of you in the room might know her from her tenure at the Museum of Arts and Applied Sciences just down the road in Ultimo. Uh, Melanie was curating uh, a range of different uh, kind of exhibitions there, including uh, the blockbuster mummies exhibition from the British Museum that I'm sure you are all familiar with and hopefully in thoroughly enjoyed. Um, Melanie also has her PhD in Egyptology from Macquarie University. She has a master's degree from the Museum Studies here at the University of Sydney. Um, she had a, uh, was in 2016 awarded the inaugural Egypt Exploration Society Cairo Fellowship. And this year we are very excited that uh, Melanie's book, Egypt in the First Intermediate Period, a chronological and historical examination of its false doors and steely is about to be published. So Melanie comes to us with a wealth of experience in museums, a wealth of experience in Egyptology. And it's absolutely, um, I'm thrilled to be able to work with her every day. She started about five weeks ago and we've been going back and forth ever since then. I hope I have not overloaded her <laughs> as she started here but I'm really excited about her new ideas about how we can really engage with the Egyptian collections, how we can talk to Egyptian community, how we can bring community voices together and how we can really progress the Nicholson collection and its interdisciplinary factors as we go forward. So I'm really excited to welcome not just Melanie for tonight as a lecturer, but also to the role of senior curator for the Nicholson Collection. Um, so thank you, Melanie. Is that on? Okay, testing, testing, you can hear me? Okay, all right. Um, 
So first of all, thank you, Candice, for the really kind introduction. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, not only as the new senior curator of the Nicholson Collection, but also for an in-person gathering. Um, when I was preparing my talk, it got me thinking, when was the last time I actually got up and spoke in front of real people? And it was back in November 2019. It was to the FenEdge Archaeology Society in the UK, so I think it's quite a momentous occasion tonight that we're all here together, and hopefully many more of these will be happening now. I guess the point of this evening is to introduce myself, and I'm very much looking forward to getting to know as many of you as possible um, after the formal proceedings. There are also some familiar faces in here tonight, so thank you so much for coming in support. Um, but to also familiarise you with some of my research interests and aspirations with the Nicholson Collection. And at this point, I'd also like to acknowledge Candice, who has done an incredible job with the collection as basically a one-woman show over the past few years with the absence of a senior curator. Um, so by now, you would have gathered that I'm an Egyptologist. Please don't hold that against me. I'm also interested in other parts of the ancient world as well, other cultures. Um, and I'm very interested in making high-quality research accessible and engaging to everyone. So also non-traditional audiences or people that don't think museums or the ancient world um, is for them. And I'll come back to this point later on. So what I'm going to focus on in my talk today, approaching the afterlife, Egyptian funerary culture and new technology, is some of the recent and ongoing research projects that I've been involved in during my time working at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge which spans Egyptian coffins, funerary stele, British pubs, now I've got your attention, <laughs> and Egyptian furniture stores. So it's a bit of a mashup, but all will be revealed shortly. I better turn this on. I'll just press this one. Okay, um, for those of you who may not be so familiar, this is the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge with its very grand and imposing facade. And it's the flagship Art and Antiquities Museum of the University of Cambridge. There are nine museums, which also includes the Botanic Gardens, and it falls under the umbrella of the University of Cambridge Museums, or UCM. Um, it was founded in 1816. Um, this is the, the founder's entrance, as we call it, um, by the seventh Viscount Fitzwilliam of Marion, and houses more than 500,000 objects spanning five key disciplines, including paintings, drawings, and prints, and this is the museum's recently refurbished 19th and 20th century European gallery. Books and manuscripts, coins and medals, applied arts, and, of course, antiquities. Um, as it currently stands, the museum's antiquities department is a fairly small team. Um, the other Egyptologist who I work very closely with is Helen Strudwick. Um, there's a classical archaeologist, Dr. Anastasia Christopolopoulou, a curatorial assistant, a technician, and two designated conservators. So as Candice mentioned, I came to work at the museum specifically on a project about their Egyptian coffins collection. But this was no ordinary project. Um, rather, as you might be aware from some of the research which has recently been undertaken here at the Nicholson Museum, as reflected in the Mummy Room, the Fitzwilliam Museum has been leading the way internationally with the cutting-edge interdisciplinary examination of its collection of more than 200 ancient Egyptian coffins and coffin fragments. More specifically, bringing together advanced imaging techniques, so the application of computer tomography or CT scanning and X-radiography, alongside subject specialists, so Egyptologists, conservators, an expert in ancient pigments, an historical paintings expert, um, an expert in ancient carpentry, and a consultant radiologist to have a much more holistic understanding about coffins in ancient Egypt. So looking not only at the construction and decoration, but also attitudes to the afterlife, concepts around object reuse and ownership, and also the economies of the ancient Egyptian funerary industry. So before I started, the project had already been underway for a few years, um, and they had shown an exhibition based on some of this research called Death on the Nile, Uncovering the Afterlife of Ancient Egypt. But the museum also wanted to have the coffins fully translated, documented, and described. They wanted a website, and they wanted to develop more innovative ways to use this research to access new and diverse audiences, including other museum professionals, and to also leverage the project to encompass new strands of research intersecting other types of material culture. And this is where I fit into the picture. 
So the museum's Egyptian antiquities collection consists of around 16,000 objects, and the very first object to be acquired into the collection in 1822 was this coffin set. It belongs to a man named Nespoi Shefit, and it's of the yellow coffin type based on the yellow um, orpiment wash that you can see on here. And it dates to around 1000 BC, which is the third intermediate period, um, or the 21st dynasty. So it was gifted to the museum by former Trinity College students, Barnard Hanbury and George Waddington. But as is quite common with acquisitions at this time, um, we don't actually know who they purchased it from, how they acquired it. Um, and unfortunately, um, this is quite common in, in many museums around the world for acquisitions at this time. Um, as you can see, the coffin set comprises a number of different parts. Um, so there's the mummy board in the centre, um, which is placed directly onto the body of the deceased. Um, the body was then placed inside the inner coffin and then nested in an outer coffin. And um, this coffin set parallels very nicely with the coffin set of Marua in uh, the Nicholson collection on display downstairs. So we know the owner's name from the inscriptions on his coffin set, um, Nespoi Shefit, which means the one who belongs to the great one of the ram's head, which is an epithet of the god Amun, is written no less than 48 times on his coffin set. He also has the nickname Nessi Amun, written down the bottom here, um, written 15 times. So they, he often did that when they couldn't fit in the whole um, length of his full name on the coffin set. Um, so while the inscriptions uh, tell us that he held a number of different honorary and functional titles, his principal roles at the time of his death was supervisor of the craftsman's workshop in Karnak, which is this very famous temple pictured here, dedicated to the gods Amun, Mut and Khonsu, and also supervisor of temple scribes of the house of Amun, or supervisor of temple scribes of Amun-Ra, king of the gods. And based on the incredible decoration that we see, it perhaps comes as no surprise because Nespoi Shefit would have had access to the top artists and presumably craftsmen working in the Karnak complex. But something that's quite interesting to point out, and I don't think this seems to be working, but you'll see, oh, here we are. So this area here um, is a different colour. It's been um, painted over or varnished over to cover an older title underneath. So presumably he was promoted to these um, positions in Karnat Temple at some point after the coffin set was uh, completed. Now we can actually reconstruct what the title was underneath um, because if you look over the entire um, decorative program on the coffin set, um, you can see some of the signs that are still preserved underneath. Um, and so using a technique called visible induced light luminescence, which detects the presence of Egyptian blue, um, you can see the contrast here of some of the older signs underneath and the new ones on top. But also, there are a few places on the coffin set, through comparison, that they forgot to cover over with these new titles. So this other title that was originally there that they covered over is Aaren Muen Per Amun, the great one of the water of the house of Amun. And interestingly, this title is not attested anywhere else that we know of in ancient Egypt. Um, something else that we did, which has become quite commonplace now in our material studies, um, is using scanning electron microscopy to identify the species of wood um, used in this case to make the coffin set. So we went to Caroline Cartwright, who's a research scientist at the British Museum, and she's also done some work here for the Nicholson Collection. And there are three species of wood, three key species used in this coffin set, um, which is cedar, tamarisk, and ficus sycamorus. And these are all native um, timbers to Egypt. And you have to remember that wood in ancient Egypt was scarce. It's a predominantly desert country. It's only really 3% of the country that is fertile, and the rest is desert. So wood was a, a luxury commodity, and you had to have money to be able to afford something like this. So clearly Nespoi Shefit was in the elite members of society. Um, and this is just showing the distribution of all the different types of wood and where it appeared structurally in the coffin set. Um, you'll also see some presence of uh, Cedrus Libani, um, which is an imported wood from Lebanon. Now, unlike some coffins which are made by hollowing out a single log, as you can see here, this is the coffin of um, Usahet from Beni Hassan, which dates to around the Middle Kingdom. Nespoi Shefit's coffin set is entirely cut from rough pieces of wood, 
some of which have been reused from other objects, including other coffins. Um, and this is a really key um, finding from this research. So if you look at all the blue co cobalt outlines here, um, these are the sort of key planks and pieces of wood used to make the coffin set. Um, then you have the pink here, which denotes um, the mortise and tenon joints to connect it together. Um, the green, so also on the lid and the box, are the dowels. So there, there are no um, uh, you know, modern metal nails being used here, um, but all these types of joints are still used in carpentry today. But the thing I really want to point out to you is these mortise holes here in pale blue, which are actually um, parts of an older coffin broken up into the production of this coffin. And the reason that we know this is because it doesn't align with the lid. And they've also used smaller pieces of wood to fill in the mortise holes. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, we've also got paste to fill the ears. And the red areas here denote modern repairs from the 1800s. So it wasn't done by the museum. Um, we can observe the same in the outer coffin. So blue again denotes the planks and pieces of wood. We have more presence of pink paste here, which is used to fill the floors in the wood. Um, also presence of paste again in the ears. The green is the dowels and the red are modern repairs. So it's interesting to just point out um, that this is a rather piecemeal coffin. Um, which on the one hand would seem at odds with the exquisite nature and technical abilities demonstrated by the external textual and visual programs of the coffin. Yet on the other hand, it shows how a highly refined luxury product can be produced from uncompromising start materials. The other thing to question is, did Ness Pricheffi know that this is what he was buying? Or did he only see it once it was all decorated? But at the same time, presumably he had input into the decoration on the coffin set. At the same time, did it even matter? Um, and with the mummy board, um, it's constructed from two long planks of wood. There's a butterfly cramp joining it together here. The hands and the face have been dowed on separately. Um, but what's quite interesting is that on the reverse of the mummy board, up here there is the presence of a rim. It's now come away. There aren't that many that survive. Um, but presumably it was placed over the head of the deceased, possibly as part of the opening of the mouth ceremony. So this is a ritual that was carried out to help revivify the deceased and restore his senses again. So we have been working with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Killen here, who is an expert in ancient Egyptian carpentry, who has made for us a number of replica tools and coffin parts, in order to get a better sense about how the joints and connectors fitted into place and how long the fabrication of these components of the coffin set might have taken to make. So if you're thinking about making your own ancient Egyptian inspired coffin set, take note because this is what you need. <laughs> um, so he has made for us an adz, which, which is used for shaping the wood, um, a tri-square for measuring your right angles, um, a bow drill with an awl for drilling holes, um, a chisel for shaping it, um, a pull saw, which only really goes in this direction for cutting the wood, and also a mallet, which was then used with the chisel and for shaping the wood as well. Um, and perhaps a cubit rod wouldn't go astray either. So uh, these are all the different types of joints that we find in Ness Pricheffit's coffin set that we can reconstruct from the CT scans and the X-rays. Um, the most common ones are, as I have already mentioned, the mortise and tenon joints and also the, um, the dowels. And as I said, all of these are still used in modern carpentry today. So we love to do a bit of experimental archaeology and we put um, Jeff to work to make for us some mortise holes. And it actually took him four hours to make one of the mortise holes for the inside of the outer coffin box and he had to sharpen his chisel every 20 minutes on a whetstone. So obviously the more you do this, the better you'll get, but um, Jeff has had a lot, a lot of experience in, in doing carpentry himself. So this just gives you a small insight into the amount of labour that went into the production of the coffin set. Um, in terms of the textual and decorative program, um, the technical accomplishment and aesthetic effort achieved on Ness Pricheffit's coffin set is without doubt exceptional. Um, scenes depicted include Ness Pricheffit worshipping various gods and goddesses, 
scenes and prayers from the Book of the Dead, such as the judgment scene. But there's also a lot more that can be revealed, particularly about the process of decorating the coffin set. So if you look here, for example, you can actually see the layers involved before the application of the pigments. So you have the wood carcass of the coffin itself, then you have a, have a layer of linen, and then calcite paste, and then the pigments. Um, the painting was carried out using a variety of pens made from single hollow stems and brushes. Um, this is actually the Junctus maritimus plant, which is found along the Nile. Um, it's also in Cambridge. I was able to find some along the River Cam. Um, and in terms of well, brushes as well, so they made their own using um, plant fibres. So we have made our own using bundles of string and then they'd dampen the end. In terms of the pigments that were used, they had a very bold but a limited um, colour palette. So red earth, um, yellow earth, orpiment, which I'll come back to, calcite, Egyptian blue and Egyptian green, which are both um, man-made pigments. Um, carbon black from soot or charcoal and also pistachio resin. So just to point out the orpiment, um, this is actually a highly toxic pigment. It's an arsenic-based sulphide mineral, and um, we've actually discovered that the ancient Egyptians used this pigment a lot more frequently than what we had previously thought. But the question is, did the ancient Egyptians know that this was a toxic pigment? And we don't know this, and one of the key reasons we don't know this is because life expectancy was already quite short in ancient Egypt, um, so that's something to ponder. Um, the pistachio resin in the bottom right corner um, was actually used as varnish. So if you look here, you'll see that sort of very lustrous effect, and that's all created from the resin from the pistachio nut tree. Um, I'll come back to the process of how we actually try to recreate our own varnish in a moment. So to help us understand how the decoration was applied to the coffins, we made a replica um, of this section in the white box from the inner coffin lid, um, working very closely with Jeff Killen and Elspeth Geltoff, who is pictured here. So she's an expert in um, historical painting techniques. Um, so Jeff made for us the wood section um, from African uh, a sapelli, so we couldn't actually use a wood from Egypt. It's very hard to source in the UK. Um, then we made our own replica paintbrushes, and step by step, we recreated every single layer involved to really understand how it was done. So once you have your wood carcass, it's a layer of linen placed on top, and then you apply a calcite paste with animal glue. Um, we're not quite sure if the orpiment wash came next. We didn't actually use orpiment to do this because it's not safe, um, or if it was the red outline of all the decorative program. But they built up the colours pigment by pigment. They didn't mix them together. It wasn't doing a bit of red and a bit of blue at the same time. It was one after the next. So they filled in all the areas with red pigment, followed by Egyptian blue, then Egyptian green. And you can see how they built it up to create a fairly sculptural effect. Um, and then they used black to put in the details. And then the final layer was applying the, uh, the varnish of the pistachio resin. So um, one thing you have to remember that the climate in the UK is not conducive to doing this, um, particularly during winter. We should have probably done this in a greenhouse. Um, but we also went to Cairo in uh, July 2019 and we sat on the steps of the Cairo Museum and we tried to recreate it there. Um, it was about 38 degrees, but still we couldn't quite get the, the right uniform consistency. It was it's very gluggy, as you can see here. It didn't quite spread the way that we were hoping that it would. Um, so that's the final product, and there's actually 10 layers involved. And this is just one small section. Um, we also can get a clue about the orientation of the coffin set, so we can know how it was positioned when they painted it. Um, so if you look at the scarab beetle, or hepri, in the centre here, you'll see how the weight of the pigment is all at the bottom. So that indicates that it was upright. Um, this is another talk in itself, but you can also see evidence of when the coffin is placed on its side and the paint drips are going downwards. So you can get a really clear picture about what the workshop might have been like at the time and where the artist was standing. So... 
As you can see, I've gotten a bit ahead of myself, um, experimental archaeology and understanding through doing and making has informed a lot of our work at the Fitzwilliam Museum, but it's also opened up many new research questions and opportunities. The first of these. Was the practice of breaking up older coffins into the production of new ones specific to a certain time frame and region? Or has it always been practiced? Can we identify any patterns? What does this tell us about the ethics of ownership and also beliefs in the afterlife? How long did it take for the deceased to turn into a sah or an eternal being? Was there a certain period of time between interment and reuse that had to pass to make the practice sanctified? Or are all the reused coffins that we're seeing offcuts or abandoned pieces from craftsmen's workshops? So in which case, it's perhaps more ethical. So one thing that would really help us to, to answer some of these questions is for the CT scanning technology to improve. Because if we can actually see the hieroglyphic inscriptions on any of these coffins, and hopefully a name, then that will help to give us more um, evidence for this. Um, so we've also been applying these same methodologies to other coffins in the collection, um, especially from different time periods, to see how the construction and decoration practices compare and contrast. So I'll just give you a very quick example. Um, this is a man called Pakepu. He dates to the late period, which is about 650 BC. Um, and his decoration, as you can see here, is rather sloppy and slapdash, it's not kept within the lines. But what's very, very interesting is that if we look at the inner coffin set, particularly the lid, it has been really, really well made. And if you look at the bottom scan there, the CT scan, it's one continuous plank of wood that has been shaped, and presumably because they didn't want to waste any of the wood, they used the offcuts into the production of the intermediate coffin, which does show um, more pieces of wood into that. But for this inner coffin, which is the one that directly covers the body, it's been exquisitely made. So again, the question is, did Parkepu know about this? Did he want to invest his money more in the construction of his coffin than in the decoration? As long as you have the inscriptions there and the iconography, it's still functional. It doesn't really matter what it looks like. But it's also about your status and what you're communicating to people. Um, we've also been encouraging other museum institutions with collections of ancient Egyptian coffins to apply the same rigorous studies so that we can build up a much clearer understanding of what was happening across all periods of pharaonic history. So um, this is another topic, and I'd love to talk about this an another time for you, but another project we've been involved in is um, a formal partnership with the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And they have about 800 Egyptian coffins, and recently they've been trying to um, improve the documentation and their approaches to research. So pictured on the left is our former head of conservation, Julie Dawson, from the Fitzwilliam Museum, um, running some courses there. But we're doing lots of classes going out there and teaching them about different ways of studying Egyptian coffins from a very interdisciplinary um, point of view, because it's quite new to them. And then on the right here, um, we had a colloquium at um, the, Muse or the Madonna Institute in Cambridge um, back in 2019, where we brought lots of researchers from around the world who are working on topics of reuse and coffins. Um, and there are many other conferences that have happened where more and more institutions are starting to adopt this type of rigorous methodology. Um, another question that presents itself is, what does the practice of reuse look like in relation to other types of funerary objects from ancient Egypt? and also during other intermediate periods. That is, those periods in Egyptian history where there was a collapse in central kingship and competing administrative centres vying for power. Because these periods are politically divided, the scholarship has generally assumed that they are also times of scarcity. But to what extent is this actually true? So as a spin-off of this research, which is based on my PhD studies, um, I've been working with a geologist, a stonemason, conservators and other Egyptologists to lead a new investigative study into the materiality of ancient Egyptian false doors and funerary stelae from the first intermediate period. So this is about a thousand years earlier than Nespoir Shefit. Not only looking for evidence of reuse, but also modifications more generally. So defacement and recarving. And I'll just share a little bit about this research with you. So a good place to start is to ask the question, what are false doors and stelae? 
Um, so they are slabs of stone that have been inscribed and decorated with painting or relief. Um, they were typically placed in the west wall of the tomb chapel facing east, um, but during the first intermediate period we don't have so many in situ examples known to us. Um, they were like grave markers and family members and priests would come and leave offerings and then the deceased's car or life force would magically travel back and forth between um, the afterlife and the land of the living to consume these offerings to sustain him for eternity. So based on my PhD research where I collected 677 of these objects in the first intermediate period, um, only 38 examples bear any sign of modifications. Um, Ten of these are additions, and I'll explain what I mean by this in a moment. Twenty-one are defacements, and four feature both additions and defacements. There are also three stelae, which show signs of possibly having been adapted and reused. And this is so, so few. And I actually find it really surprising because at this time in Egyptian history, they cut off trade routes and also there was a lot of interwarring happening both on a national level and locally. But if we think about the medium in which Egyptian funerary stelae were made, which is limestone, this is a readily abundant material. So if you were carving a stela and you made a terrible mistake, providing you had the funds to resource it, you could just go and quarry some more stone and make a new one. Trees, on the other hand, as I said before, are scarce, particularly those that can actually yield the right timber for carpentry and would have been a much more precious commodity. Having said that, however, there are different quality limestones. Tura limestone, for example, which was the stone used for building the Great Pyramids at Giza, was considered more special because of its brilliant whiteness and numinous aspects. While limestone, which is quarried from Thebes in the south of the country, typically wasn't used in the production of stele or architecture more generally because of its heterogeneity of structure and the presence of hard silicous nodules, so flints or cherts. But despite this, modifications made to stone objects are known to have occurred in ancient Egypt as early as the Second Dynasty, so about 2800 BC. While the reuse of entire tombs and objects, including false doors, is well attested after the 5th dynasty, so about 2350 BC. So this means that scarcity is unlikely to be the key motivation for modifying or reusing stone objects at this time. So other reasons must have been at play. So I'll just give you a sense of what these types of modifications are that we're seeing. Um, and the first category are additions. So additions can be in the form of adding hieroglyphic signs, um, so it's a bit faint, but this is the writing of uh, Jeddu, which is a place called Bosiris in ancient Egypt, and you'll see the quail chick here, which has been written on top of the painted border. Um, and below it is the writing of Abedu, which is a Bydos, and you can see part of the city sign determinative overlapping with the border. Um, on this example of the stele of Shemai, there's a dedication text which has been added afterwards. And this is when a family member has um, publicly said that they ended up sort of paying for this stele for their father or for their brother or whoever. Um, on this stele of Hekaib, you can see the addition of a small figure over here, which has actually been added next to the beginning of a biographical text. And then this is one of my favourite objects from the first intermediate period. It's the false door of Neferu in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and it's a bit hard to see, but he has actually had his breast extended. Um, the artist has painted it to look bigger. And this is often a sign of indicating that he has um, risen in the ranks of the administration in Egypt. Um, and often you'd also find tummy, tummy rolls as well. So he's indoors, um, he's well fed, well nourished. So it's you know, a sign of... Um, a bit of indulgence, I guess. <laughs> and then we also have graffiti, made in both ancient and modern times. Um, this is a false door that I've been doing a lot of research on in the uh, Fitzwilliam collection, but you can see there are some graffiti marks here um, and also here. It's quite difficult to tell if it's ancient or modern. Um, the best way of trying to distinguish it is based on the freshness of the stone, if it doesn't actually have anything meaningful that's written there. Um, so, as you can see, these are all rather minor and harmless um, modifications made to stele, done probably not long after the original stele was made, 
and probably taking place in the artist's workshop to both satisfy a request of the client and to ensure that the steel are functioned properly. Defacement, on the other hand, gets juicier. Um, it predominantly consists of chiseling or scratching out parts of the figures depicted on the stealer. Um, so you can see here the faces have all been scratched out, also of the offering bearers here. Um, you can see through their legs and some of their arms here it's been cut through, um, and the dog's face. But interestingly, the text has all been preserved, the name of the owner hasn't been scratched out, and nor have the offerings here. Um, on this example, so going back to Heka'ib, you can see the faces that have been scratched out um, and also the feet down here, but again, the text hasn't been touched. Um, I'm sorry this is not the best example, but this is in the Cairo Museum and there are normally a pair of wadjet eyes here and they've also been cut out. Um, so of the faces of the owner many and his whole body here. Um, but again, the text is preserved. Um, and then on this dealer of a lady called Iret, um, you can actually see that the offering formula has been cut out, but again, you can read her name and her face has been preserved. Um, when it comes to reuse, um, this is a bit more of a grey area, but the way I'm defining it um, is that this dealer was originally assigned to someone else, so you can see an, a name of someone else under here originally that's been smoothed over and they've recarved a new name on top, which is Nebhek. There are other lots of interesting things happening with this dealer, but I'll save that for another day. Um, and on this dealer, a new name for Sebek Hetep has been added on top. And then coming back to Hemi Ra's false door, which I've been working on for the last three or four years, actually. It's so interesting. But um, you can actually see, and, and I won't point it out here, but it was originally carved for a man. So the figures at the bottom were originally a man and then adapted for a woman. But the texts have never been modified. So it wasn't actually assigned to a man by name, just by the gender of the figures at the bottom. Um, so while this is still an area of research that I'm investigating, um, I'd just like to share a few preliminary observations with you. Um, first of all, the nature of modifications made to funerary stelae during the first intermediate period were relatively targeted and controlled. The faces, bodies and parts of human figures and dogs that have been defaced are almost always done so with relative precision and composure, rather than a frenzied attack. The features are typically chiselled out with respect for the original form and seemingly the monument itself, suggesting that the perpetrator or perpetrators had time and probably also knowledge of the functions of the stealer. There is also little attempt to suppress the owner's identity. Although tampering with a few names is visible, they can all be read and understood and the identity of the owner reconstructed. Thus, what I think we might be seeing is that the intention of the perpetrator or perpetrators in relation to Stille at this time is to publicly shame the owner and to tarnish their memory as a result of some wrongdoing. But the questions that I'm still grappling with are, what effect would this have had on their chances of an afterlife? Is there a different value or meaning accorded to each component of the stealer, which when modified was believed to generate different outcomes? And who was the intended audience for this defacement? Was it the family? We don't know the original locations, as I mentioned, for many of the false doors and stelae from this period. But for those that we do have, they are usually aligned with the burial shaft embedded in or resting against a wall of the tomb superstructure. So just to wrap up a few thoughts here, um, while many people tend to think about reuse, recycling, graffiti and vandalism as being modern concepts, they are, of course, very clearly embedded in ancient times and not just in ancient Egypt. And I'm so happy that Candace, I can't actually see you, but um, is doing her research on recycling of architecture in Paphos because this brings a wonderful collaboration that I'm looking forward to embarking on with her. Um, but I think it's by using our modern day experiences and encounters that this is how we connect audiences, particularly those who perhaps don't think that the ancient world um, have any, has any relevance to them. And it's also a way to make connections and build awareness and curiosity. So on that note, the final part of my talk today will focus on the impact of our research on audiences, particularly non-traditional museum-going audiences, using the Coffins research as a case study, but focusing on the idea of a pop-up museum. So what am I talking about? 
A pop-up museum is where real researchers, so for example, Egyptologists and conservators, bring real museum objects, craft replicas, hands-on activities, and digital experiences into the heart of communities who might not otherwise have access to our research. Now, while it's certainly not uncommon for museums to have a physical presence outside their walls, what makes the pop-up unique is the ability to interact firsthand with real researchers and subject specialists, as opposed to intermediaries like education officers. There is the element of surprise. So we appear in locations where people would typically not expect to have a cultural encounter. A pub, a supermarket, a shopping centre, a food bank, public thoroughfares. And also it's an opportunity for us to interact with new and diverse audiences, many of whom have little, if any, experience of visiting museums. Now the whole impetus for doing this was the Death on the Nile exhibition that the Fitzwilliam had back in 2016. When we looked back at the evaluation results, the majority of people that attended were from the local Cambridge area, and they all had degree or postgraduate degree qualifications. But I don't know how many of you are familiar with Cambridge here, or if you've heard of this place called Wisbeach. A raise a show of hands? Yeah, OK. So if, I'll tell you a bit about Wisbeach anyway. So it's in Cambridge here. It's one hour and 20 minutes from Cambridge by car, but it's actually reported to be one of the most deprived towns, not only in Cambridgeshire, but the whole of the United Kingdom. About one third of residents are non-native English speakers from Eastern Europe. There is a high rate of unemployment, while many others are on the basic minimum wage. But perhaps most surprisingly of all, according to the last census, 35.1% have no qualifications, and 19.1% are estimated to have skills at entry level or below for literacy. And this is completely at odds with the reputation of its near neighbour, Cambridge. So, we had some funding from the Arts and Humanities Impact Fund from Cambridge University to pilot this idea in Wisbeach. So we went to the Weatherspoons, which is um, a, a famous pub chain throughout the UK. We went to Morrison's Supermarket, we went to um, a marketplace in Wisbeach and set up our little tent outside Costa Coffee. We went to a community or two community centres. Um, Wisbeach is kind of divided east and west, and one side is all the migrant community, and the other side are all the British Anglo Brexit supporters. <laughs> <laughs> So this is at the Rosmini Community Centre, and um, we actually discovered when we were there that they were ho holding their own carpentry workshops with migrant communities. So it was a perfect fit. And I'll tell you what we do, we do in the pop-ups in a moment. Then we set up outside the local Wisbeach Museum um, to try and get people to go into their museum because very few people actually visit it, and they do have a really wonderful collection. And you should look it up because they have um, some of Charles Dickens' original manuscripts there as well. Um, and then we went to a food bank, and this is the most challenging of all the locations we went to. Um, the only thing I could really bring that down to is that people have different priorities and concerns um, going to a food bank. But we wanted to trial it anyway. Um, so what can people expect to see and do at a pop-up museum? So as I said, we bring real museum objects. So on the left, in a mounted showcase, we have a fragment of a face and a hand from a yellow coffin set which is the same time period as Ness Poichefit, so we can still tell that story through these fragments. We got Jeff to make the craft replica tools for us, which we had also in a mounted display case. Um, we had a painting activity where people can learn to make their own ancient Egyptian paintbrushes and use ochres just like they did in ancient Egypt to write their name in hieroglyphs or do colouring in activities. Um, we had iPads with us and we made a series of films demonstrating how the different tools were made. And you can see the Arabic subtitles because we have also done this in Egypt, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, and I had a grant in 2019 to work with a company, this is not the best image, but um, to work with a company called Think C3D. So working from the CT scan data of Ness Pashefit's coffin set, we created a digital animation to show how all the pieces fit together. So if you do go on our website, oh, sorry, I can't say our because I don't work there anymore, egyptiancoffins.org, you can watch the whole animation of how everything fits together with a coffin set. Um, and then this is one of my favourite things that we did. So on the left is a real um, coffin for a dog from Benny Hassan from the Fitzwilliam collection. And then we got 
Jeff to make us a one-to-one -one craft replica. So it's like a 3D jigsaw puzzle. So the best way of really understanding is through doing and making yourself so people could actually pull it apart, put it back together again, and, you know, dowels and tenons, you know, it's not familiar to everyone. So when you actually see it like this, it really gels and you understand what people are talking about. Um, we also made a publication, How to Make an Egyptian Coffin, which we gave away to people. Um, the one thing that occurred to us sooner than what we would have hoped is that the literacy levels were lower than we thought, and um, a lot of people gave the books back to us. It's a little bit sad. Um, so while sharing our research in relevant and meaningful ways is important, it's really key to note here that the Pop-Up Museum is intended to be very much a two-way exchange. We also learn from visitors, especially those who have worked in trades such as carpentry and joinery, and we provide a friendly ear, often listening to people sharing their personal stories, which could be as wide-reaching as their holiday experiences in Egypt, an ancient Egyptian documentary they recently saw, or even a personal tragedy that someone's endured. And I have had many chats with people about even crimes they've committed in the past and how there are many young offenders also in, in Whiz Beach, and it's quite an eye-opener to do this. We wanted to measure this as well. We wanted to actually show our funders that we have impact in doing these pop-up museums and we can make a difference to people. And the University College London developed, um, not just for museums, but just cultural institutions um, and beyond that too, um, about how to measure the impact on people's well-being. So we established this visual chart and we asked people to tell us how they felt before their encounter with us and also afterwards. Um, and it's, of course, a nice thing to report that people did say they came or went, went away feeling a lot happier after having their encounter with us. Um, and I think something that we learned from this is that we're also playing a role in counteracting um, feelings of loneliness and isolation. Um, we also had impact in terms of media, so the BBC News picked up on this. Um, and then we were featured in the Weatherspoon News, and they have a readership <laughs> of two million people, so don't underestimate that. <laughs> Um, we also made it to the Whiz Beach Post. And then here, this is perhaps the, the icing on the cake for us. So the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cambridge every year has a Research and Impact Engagement Award, and we won it for the Pop-Up Museum, or the whole Coffins Project, actually, for the collaboration category. So this is with um, Professor Stephen Toop in the centre when we received the award um, back in 2019. Um, something else that we did um, was... We got another, I mean, we're always after money, so we got some more funding to work with the Rosmini Community Centre who had their own buses to bring groups of people from Whiz Beach to the museum as a day out excursion. Um, so we gave them a tour of the museum, we had lunch with them, and it was really lovely. But the issue is, how do you sustain that? So that, since COVID happened, nothing has been able to resume. Um, and as you're probably aware, the COVID situation in the UK is um, still quite bad. <laughs> Um, but this is something that I know that they want to keep uh, continuing with. So in parallel to this, as I mentioned previously, we've also been working with colleagues at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo on a two-way knowledge transfer project about Egyptian coffins. Um, and this has been funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, which unfortunately, because of Brexit, um, is now not available to um, universities in England anymore. Um, so I mentioned before that there's 800 Egyptian coffins, so they have the largest um, collection of coffins of anywhere in the world in the Tahrir Museum, and this is just an idea of the volume of what's on display, but there's a lot in storage as well. Um, and because of the new Grand Egyptian Museum that they've been building for many years, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, um, inshallah it's going to open in November this year to coincide with the centenary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. But because so many objects have been moved from the Cairo Museum out to the GEM, there's been a big international project to help um, bring new life to the museum in Tahrir Square. So that's predominantly come from EU funding. So there's the British Museum involved in that, um, the Museo Egizio in Torino, um, the Louvre are involved in Leiden. Um, we have been playing a smaller part with a separate funding body, as I said, with GCRF focusing specifically on coffins and the redisplay of the galleries that held the royal mummies. So that is planned to be a new display of mummy portraits from the Roman period. That's also another topic. 
Um, so back in July 2019, um, we went out to Cairo a number of times um, and gave some lectures about our work on how to engage audiences with the research on the coffins that we've been doing. Because something that we discovered um, relatively soon into this work, into this project, was that curators and conservators at the Egyptian Museum had very little, if any, experience in face-to-face -face public engagement. So they're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, research is still something that they're developing um, at the museum, but it's making that connection between who comes to the museum and what you're doing behind the scenes. So this was so, so much fun. <laughs> um, we had the lectures, and then we got to go into the shop area of the museum, which is basically the exit of um, the Cairo Museum. And we had a practical demonstration with about 30 curators and conservators from the, the Tahrir Square Museum. And we showed them how you set up a pop-up. So something I should point out is that with our funding, we have reproduced everything from the pop-up in the UK and given it to them in Cairo so they can do this themselves. So the peer-to-peer -peer training network is essentially what we've established. So colleagues then train other colleagues, and we're starting to set up other museums across the country in Egypt to also take this on. Um, so they have all the um, infrastructure to do this, but we're trying to encourage them to use objects from their own collection and using their own research. Um, so what was really wonderful is that we spent about an hour sort of doing this training with them and, and teaching them what types of things that we say and how to engage with different types of audiences. But literally, it wasn't that long before they started doing it themselves. And we just stepped back, and then it was our Egyptian colleagues on the floor talking about objects from the Fitzwilliam collection, but tailoring it to their own experiences, their own stories, um, how, what they've done in the collection at the museum. And it was really wonderful to see. Then we thought, OK, let's go somewhere else. So we took the pop-up to this furniture store in a place called Mardi in Cairo as well. It's about, well, depends on the traffic, one and a half hours from <laughs> downtown Cairo. Um, and we did the same thing there, but this time we tried to encourage um, our Egyptian colleagues from the start to do the setup and to do all the interactions. Um, the difference here is that it wasn't a surprise pop-up. Um, we worked with the owner to contact their mailing list, which is a, a very different audience again. It was quite a the upper echelons of modern Egyptian society, people that appreciate design and furniture that came to this one. But the reason we did this was because the owner of this furniture store has a huge carpentry factory in a place called Damietta, which is in the Delta. And Damietta is the heart of Egypt's modern carpentry industry. So in November 2019, um, we then took the pop-up with our Egyptian colleagues to Damietta, and this time we focused working specifically with the men in the factory at Damietta. And this is a fabulous exchange about their modern carpentry techniques and also what we could share with them from ancient Egypt. They were extremely engaged. I think we spent about four or five hours there. And here you can see them actually trying out all the craft replica tools. We also went to a sports club um, and a, a local library in Damietta as well. So I guess my point here is that working with source communities for me is really, really important. And on that note, I just want to share with you a few of my aspirations based on the research um, that I've just presented to you this evening for the Nicholson Collection. Um, I just want to emphasize that, OK, my interest is Egypt, but that's only one part of our antiquities collection, and don't think that I'm going to neglect the rest of it. And of course, there's Candace, who um, is extremely enthusiastic and passionate and fills those other gaps as well. <laughs> So I'm really keen to focus on developing strong, meaningful relationships with all of our communities that um, have objects you know, from their heritage in our collection, but I'd like to focus immediately on the Arabic-speaking communities. I'd like to include some community voices in the museum's interpretation and storytelling and be a conduit to inspiring the Arab migrant and second, third-generation communities to connect with their cultural heritage. Now, if you're going to ask me in the drinks afterwards, what, what do you mean by that? My answer is going to be, I don't know yet, because I'm going to spend several months talking with community members and finding out what they would like from the museum. So it's going to be a slow process. I did start doing this a little bit when the Mummies exhibition was on at the Powerhouse Museum. So I have the community contacts, but you know that was about six years ago, and things have changed a lot since then as well. And, and what is the museum like post-COVID? 
if I can say post-COVID yet. Um, I'm, I've talked to Paul, uh, sorry, I've talked to Craig, I've talked to Candice and some other colleagues about this, but I'm keen to, to, to trial um, the pop-up museum here in Sydney, um, particularly looking at those underrepresented audiences. I think something that we sometimes forget about with a university museum, and um, this is something that is rife in Cambridge, is that if you haven't been to university, a lot of people don't think that going to a university museum is for them or that they're even allowed on campus. Um, so you want to try and dis to dispel some of those sentiments. And I think a good way of starting to do that is by going out to the people. In terms of the Egyptian collection itself, um, obviously I'd love to do more work on the Coffins collection as an international partnership with the Fitzwilliam Museum and the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm still an affiliated researcher there, so I've, I do have my foot in both camps, and I'm going to make the most of that. Um, I'm also really keen to launch a major project, again with Cambridge, to look at the topic of modifications and reuse in the ancient world more generally. Um, and we already had a chat with the other curators from the Maclay and the Art Gallery collections last week about the idea of an exhibition intersecting all of the collecting areas here um, at the Nicholson, uh, sorry, at the Chow Chapwin Museum. And there is great scope here with this topic. Um, obviously, I have a, a love of Stele, and I've, I've already been through the Stele collection here, and I'd love to comprehensively um, publish and exhibit that. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, this year is a really important year in the history of Egyptology, with the centenary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, and also the bicentenary of the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. So watch this space, because we are planning um, for some uh, fabulous events to recognise that. Um, but of course, I want to hear from you as well, so I'd love you to join me um, for drinks now, and please also give me your feedback and what you think can be done with the Nicholson Collection. So thank you for your attention.